Today we're going to be talking about vibration of rotating machinery. This is part of a continuing webinar series that ENCODE presents that describes various uses of ENCODE software in solving engineering challenges. Today we're going to focus on an engineering challenge called rotating machinery that vibrates too much. So with that being said, what are we going to learn here today? We're going to learn how we can analyze vibration data and understand durability characteristics and vibration sources and such in rotating machinery. To do that, we're going to start with a simple definition, what is meant by vibration of rotating machinery. After all, if we can't define what the problem is, then unfortunately the rest of this webinar will be spent uh, off the mark. So first off, we'll have to decide what is this rotating machinery and vibration and, and so on, what does this mean? Understanding that, then we'll dig into that engineering concept or problem, I guess you could say, the engineering challenge of how to m manage uh, vibration of rotating machinery and also how ENCODE Glyphworks software can help an engineer gain understanding of, of this phenomena. We're going to conclude today with a live software demonstration. So I'll have a few slides at the start here just to try to set the stage and understand what the problem statement is and some definitions and such. And then we'll get into looking at how we could dig into these vibration problems or scenarios uh, using the ENCODE software. At the end, as Kim mentioned, we'll have a question and answer session, so please, you can provide questions uh, through the WebEx Q&A panel, and I will do my best to answer those questions at the end of this presentation. So as I said earlier, this is part of a continuing ENCODE webinar series that deals with different aspects in the engineering durability and vibration world, and also how ENCODE software can provide benefit to engineers such as yourselves. There are three components in the ENCODE software going from left to right. D for design life. This is for understanding fatigue and durability characteristics using finite element derived stresses, so virtual fatigue calculations, you could say. In the middle is GlyphWorks. This is analysis of measured test data, whether it's vibration related or fatigue and structural related. We're going to focus on the, on the, on the vibration side today. And then the last uh, product you see on the screen is ENCODE Automation, which is test data management and automated analysis. Today we're going to focus on Glyphworks. Uh, as a matter of fact, not just focus on Glyphworks, but focus on a very specific use case within Glyphworks, which is understanding things that turn round and round and what kind of durability and or vibration characteristics arise from that and how we can manage those characteristics as best uh, our engineering judgment allows us to. So let's think about this, an analysis of rotating machinery. Let's make sure we're all on the same page with the definition here. In the upper right corner is a, a kind of a cartoonish looking pump. And things like this, pumps, turbines, gears, differentials, things that turn around and around are interesting because they see stress or vibration or motion or create noise uh, per revolution. Or as a matter of fact, it may be that this pump produces some type of vibration characteristic, not just per revolution, but at some number of times per revolution, or a harmonic, we would call it, a harmonic of a revolution rate. Now the challenge then, that's fine, but the challenge is that usually a test engineer, when he or she records product usage data, stress, strain, vibration, G levels, temperature, pressure, whatever, when we record these um, channel data in the field, customer service data, these are recorded in the time domain. And what happens in this pump or this gear or turbine or whatever it is, is not so much time domain based, but rather revolution based. Now the time domain can tell us lots of things. For example, a time domain is very important to me to make sure I, I get up in the morning on time. Otherwise my kid misses the bus. So the time side of things is very important. But for pumps and stuff, rotating things, there's another way we should be looking at this and that is in a per revolution basis. So really then, we're going to focus today on trying to answer this question. What can we learn by looking at vibration or durability data in a periodic or harmonic way? How do we do that? And what unique insight does that afford us as engineers? I'm going to talk today about two different use cases, things that rotate at a constant speed and things that rotate at a variable speed. The nice part about Glyphworks as analysis software is that it can provide solutions to both scenarios, 
both the constant speed and the variable st speed scenario. The constant speed scenario, that's the picture on the lower left, I'm going to describe this first. The channel data we have here, the red squiggly line, is not very squiggly actually, it's cylinder pressure, and it goes up and down and up and down. This is from an engine. The blue line below it is the speed at which the engine is turning. So this is just essentially the, the PV cycle of an engine measured in the time domain. Since it's running at a nominal constant speed, the time period between one increase and decrease of pressure up to the next one is fixed. So in this sense, the analysis of this type of data is quite simple. With a fixed or constant rotational speed, periodic characteristics happen at a constant period, and it's easy, easy for us to see them in the, in the time domain. And it's also easy for us to recognize them in the frequency domain. Now, think about this differently, though. What happens if we can't record data at constant speed? What if we need to record data in the customer's hands or on an open road test where the speed of whatever component we're after is actually varying continuously? This raises the question of how do we deal with variable period data? In the time domain, as the speed increases, the period per rotation or per revolution will decrease and vice versa as the speed drops. Therefore, we don't have the luxury or the simplicity of falling back on a constant delta t. But this is no problem, as you'll see today. We'll look at both constant and variable speed data and see that Glyphworks provides solutions for both. One solution we're going to look at today for understanding rotational machinery dynamics is what we call waterfall analysis. This is tracking vibration magnitude as a function of speed and frequency. So this is a a color map or a waterfall analysis display. We'll see this live in just a little bit. What this shows is, is vibration magnitude and color, from blue being low magnitude up to red being high magnitude. And then the bottom axis is in frequency, cycles per second. And then on, on the right side, the vertical axis is in speed. So this would be speed of the, uh, the say, a rotating shaft, the crankshaft in an engine, or the output shaft of a transmission, or the main uh, main rotor shaft in a threshing mechanism on a combine. What's interesting here is we have some of these fixed relationships we see between the rate at which something is turning and the frequency at which it vibrates. This is called a harmonic of engine speed or har harmonic of the main rotational speed. Some people call this orders or order tracking where we have for example, the purple line I've outlined here, we have a lot of vibration energy, that's the high color, and it shows that the frequency of vibration changes as the speed changes. As a matter of fact, as one goes up, so does the other. Further, as a matter of fact, there's a fixed relationship between those two. The relationship is the order. This is how many times a revolution, something else vibrates. So how many vibration cycles, what frequency, do we get per rotation of the shaft? That brings up the idea of the order, and we'll look at these live in just a minute, and we'll use this not just to analyze some data, but also to see what unique insight this brings to us that allows us to understand what's causing the source of vibration. We're also going to look today at what we call a periodic display, in which we can take data that's recorded in a time domain, because it's convenient to us, and then fold it up and look at it in a periodic domain, because that's what ultimately drives periodic vibration, is looking at some type of a period. You'll see that it's quite simple in Glyphworks to specify a period if we're running at constant speed, or use another glyph to resample if we're running at variable speed, and then specify a period not in the time domain, but rather in the revs domain. For example, a four-stroke engine, we want to look at two full revolutions of the engine for everything to repeat itself. We'll take a look at this in just a minute. Also, along with these calculations, if we're looking at something varying periodically, as we do here, we can look at statistically enveloping the upper and lower bounds of this trace. This can give us an idea of when something cycles periodically, how much variability is there? What's the average G level experienced by a helicopter's rotor during rotation? envelope that. What's the worst case? What's the best case? What's the average? Just how variable is that? So then that can be used for understanding vibration and also can be used for understanding durability. We need to understand for durability, of course, 
the spectrum of cycles that result. Not every blade rotation produces the same amount of stress. So we need to understand the variability of that, and that's the periodic statistics calculation I'm showing on my screen right now. So three things we're going to look at now inside GlyphWorks. First off, waterfall analysis, order tracking. That's the picture you see on the screen. Second, we'll look at periodic displays, both constant and variable speed. And lastly, we'll look at something with a more durability bent to it, and that is looking at gear set torque versus speed versus revs. What I mean by this is understanding how many cycles at given torques and speed levels does a transmission experience. So let's go take a look. We'll see this live now. I'll switch over into looking at GlyphWorks here. This is the GlyphWorks screen. I don't know how many of you guys have, have used this. I'm going to give a, maybe a two or three minute introduction to GlyphWorks in case this is new to you. The short version of what is GlyphWorks is it's an environment, an application for analyzing measured test data. The way it gets its name is through these functions or glyphs we see. We call these glyphs over here on the right side. There are about 110 or some odd number of glyphs. Uh, inside GlyphWorks, and we're going to use these functions or operators or mathematical widgets, you can say, to try to answer some of these questions today about rotating dynamics. Over on the left side, this is what we call the available data window. This is time series data from a variety of different sources. Today I've narrowed down from a very broad channel set. You guys as test engineers may collect things like load and strain and temperature and CAN bus signals and GPS and microphone data and so on. I'm going to focus today on the vibration and durability side, which would be accelerometers and strain gauges. The time series data we're going to start with is this data right here called engine run-up. This is from an engine dyno test. Only two parameters were recorded at the time. The top one, the red squiggly line here, is g the G level versus time. This could be strain as well, or load, or any parameter that helps us understand structural or vibration response. So this is G loading versus time. Also down at the bottom is a far less squiggly line. This is an RPM trace. This just shows how the test rig controller is driving the engine through a sweep of engine speeds from, as you can see here, about 1300 RPM up to about 3100 RPM. So the question we're trying to answer here is what causes this thing to vibrate so much? So we've tested over a wide range of speeds so we can understand not just at constant speed but how vibration characteristics may differ with the fundamental input, that being the crankshaft, rotating at different speeds. Now the time domain is really nice. As I said before, that's what ensures I get my kid on the bus at the right time every morning. We can also see in the time domain, looking at this data, that we have vibration magnitudes that are increasing somewhat over time, but the, are the largest at the end of the time. Okay, so we can learn neat things out of the time domain. What I want to do next is look at the next building block in understanding vibration. We start with time domain data, and I'm going to use this glyph called the frequency spectrum. This will perform Fourier's transform on the math. It's got time series data coming in and what comes out will be frequency spectra. And this is one very common technique used to analyze vibration data. Let's just plug these together like this. We've got a couple of glyphs on the screen, and now we'll go run this. When I run this, this means open up the floodgates and data will flow and, and so on. And what I get then as a result is, let's uh, look at one frequency spectrum here coming out the back end on a log scale. Here's the frequency spectrum of the first channel of time series data. So now this is in the frequency domain with a measure of Gs. This is what we call the frequency spectrum, or to be more technically correct, this would be called the power spectral density, or PSD. So we can, lean, we can learn interesting things by looking at data in the frequency domain. For example, we can learn what frequencies are, are present in the time domain, what, what frequencies or what sign tones of response have high energy levels. Now the challenge here is that frequency comes from time domain periods or periodicity, and the speed of the crankshaft is changing during our run-up test, which means this completely inviolates 
our assumption of what we call stationary or ergodic time series data. That means that we're assuming that we're, we have a constant input and we're measuring output. We don't have a constant input, we have a changing speed. So we're fundamentally missing out on a relationship between frequency and time or frequency and speed in doing this calculation. We're ignoring the, the time or speed-based element in looking at the calculation we've done so far. So what we'll do is we'll augment this analysis by using one or two extra glyphs. First off, this one here called joint time frequency could be useful to us. This glyph says, calculate a series of frequency spectra and pile them up versus time. In other words, make up a 3D color map with frequency and time and color being shown by vibration magnitude. I actually want to go one step past that. We started talking about waterfall analysis before. So this time I'm going to use a waterfall analysis glyph to index my frequency spectra relative to time. Use a, a appropriate waterfall display glyph on the end to take a look at the answers like this. And make this bigger so we can see it nicely. This is going to be a nice colorful plot. I'm going to dip into the properties of the waterfall analysis glyph here. These are some basic settings. For example, I'm going to calculate the amplitude spectrum. And I also need to tell it which channels go together. So frequency spectrum I can calculate on any time series. Uh, waterfall analysis, to be indexed to speed, I need to tell this glyph which channel is the response I care about and which channel is the speed that I want to index relative to. So the syntax here is 1, 2, like this. 2 is the speed channel that's used for lookup, and 1 is the vibration channel that's used to create frequency spectra. Go ahead and run this process. And what we have now is a G, a G level on the vertical as a function of frequency. Okay, we've seen something like that before. But now also we have RPM data. So it's not just a frequency plot, it's a frequency and speed plot. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit so we can see better what's going on. Like this. Choose that narrower frequency band. And now we can see, actually, it looks like there's some frequency content that changes a bit as speed changes. Now, before we dig into that, just point out a couple of ways we can display this data. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you can see it better. Some people like to look at this as a like a series of mountain ranges. Other people say, no, no, I'd like to see a, a surface plot and then maybe view it from the top down. So here's my top down plot. I'm going to zoom in a little bit further like this, so I can see these brightly colored lines at the at the end there even better. All right, so this is interesting now. Um, anywhere we see an angled line, it would show then that the frequency content of response vibration is increasing or changing with the fundamental crankshaft speed. So it looks like there's some relationship, some fixed relationship here. If we had a resonant condition where we had a vibration that was independent of speed, we'd see that as a vertical line here. For example, if our engine was mounted on a test stand that resonated at some frequency because of lack of fixture stiffness or mass control, we would see that constant frequency as a vertical line here. So we need to go investigate what's going on with these angled colored lines. I'm going to put a cursor in here. This is what we call an order cursor. And I can, as I move the cursor around, I have a yellow call-out box in the upper left corner there. This says this is what we call a second-order vibration. And then this one over here would be a third-order vibration, and this one here, and so on, is a fourth-order vibration. So I can put these cursors on to understand which orders or harmonics of rotation speed are the ones of the high vibration magnitude. This can be very useful because if I have a noise concern, for example, an unpleasant vibration that results in this engine, I can look and see what's the highest acoustic level or vibration level or strain level that results from that noise. In my plot here, I can see the highest order. Let's go back to looking at it this way. The highest order is the second order. So if something happens twice per revolution that causes a large amount of response vibration energy. Now this is a four cycle engine with four cylinders in it. So two revolutions are required to go through the, the full um, combustion cycle. 
four cylinders, so that means four times every two revolutions there's a big bang from the combusting gases. So this second order vibration is probably caused by combustion. Third order and fourth order from other sources. If we found that this highest vibration level was at an order that was something odd like, say, 2.7, that would indicate that 2.7 times per crankshaft revolution, something vibrates. Now, a lot of things are driven by pulleys on an engine like this. Power steering pump used to be, isn't so much anymore. Uh, generator set, uh, air conditioning compressor, and so on. So basic pulley ratios, or running operating speeds of, say, the air conditioning compressor relative to the crankshaft, will tell us what a 2.7 order vibration actually comes from. We may know from basic math that a 2.7 order vibration is, for example, the the power steering pump, and that may be something that we need to go look at its bearings. If we had gear sets, we may look for something like, we may find a 17th order. Well, that means we get some vibration 17 times per revolution. You can think back to, say, if we had a, a ball bearing set that a gear set rotated on. 17 balls per gear set means that 17 times per revolution if we have a pitted race, we have the ball passing by 17 times per revolution, and that could be suspect as the cause of the 17th order vibration. So we can learn a lot of things, first by looking in the frequency domain, and then we can also learn further if we have speed recorded as well, we can learn things about rotating componentry like pumps and gears and turbines and rotating assemblies like that, we can learn a lot by looking at ratios of output speed to input speed. At what rate is a vibration occurring relative to an input? So that's what we call waterfall analysis. Now I'm going to open up another workspace here. So I'm going to keep what I'm working on, but I'm going to add some more glyphs to the screen now. This is just like adding tabs to a spreadsheet. What I want to look at next is some actual engine cylinder data. So I'll make this a little bit bigger here. And what we have is two channels. At the top, this is cylinder pressure measured versus time. And at the bottom is the speed at which the crank is rotating. Let's zoom in a little bit here and see what's going on. So we can see cylinder pressure varies in what looks to be a periodic manner. It goes up and comes down. It goes up again, comes down. That's part of the PV cycle inside the engine. This is the reason why the engine is there, to be able to, to hold pressure and then let it out and do work. The speed channel at the bottom is uh, varying and it looks to be more highly varied than the cylinder pressure. If we zoom out a little bit, it actually looks a bit like the speed, the engine speed, is uh, quite noisy. Uh, it varies anywhere from 2300 RPM up to 2500 RPM. And uh, I know from when this data was collected that it should have been collected at a nominal 2400 RPM fixed speed. So a question here is why is that why is that speed, the crankshaft speed, changing so much? Is it a transducer that's having trouble, a loose connector, electromagnetic interference? We have cleanup tools for all this inside Glyphworks, but the key thing here is actually let's take this out of the time domain into a periodic domain first and then look and see if that variation of speed is actually a reasonable thing. So inside this display glyph, I'm going to make take advantage of the periodicity of this of this plot by looking under axes and limits. And I'm going to switch into this thing called periodic mode. And it says, okay, what window do you want to work with? Well, I'm going to use a 500th of a second window because if you do the math, 2400 RPM converted into revolutions per second and then the uh, inverse of that is what's the time period per revolution? And I've decided in this case to use a 0 0.05 window to capture that. I'll say OK. Now what's happening here, the plot is made by taking the time series data and then essentially making it into fancy origami. Take that time series data and fold it up in five hundredths of a second long chunk. Fold it back and forth on itself so it's almost like a fan and then hold the resulting 500th of a second wide slice up to the light, and then look and see all the traces uh, above or below each other. So now we see in this constant speed, and we're lucky we have constant speed here, 
constant speed, speed 2400 RPM, one revolution every five hundredths of a second, we can see then that cylinder pressure is highly repeatable. As a matter of fact, you can see it peaks up. There's slight amount of variability, but um, you can see that it's uh, quite well bounded. What's even more interesting than this is, is the speed of the engine. The speed of the engine does vary from 2500 RPM to 2300 RPM, but it does so periodically. This is what's so cool. So you can actually see that as the gas mixture is compressed by the inertia of the, of the crankshaft, the crankshaft slows down instantaneously. And then as the combustion leads into the expansion stroke, that's this here, the crankshaft actually accelerates. This is why we have an engine, right? This is why we have gas coming into this engine, so we can do work like this. The whole idea is to accelerate the crankshaft, get it past its own inertia, get it past the compression, and do work for us so I can drive to work or so I can race a car, or I can do whatever I need to, keep my food cold in my refrigerator. So what looked to be a highly variable and maybe even suspect quality time, time series channel for crankshaft speed actually turns out to be really insightful for looking at the dynamics of the crankshaft in a per revolution kind of a way. This is the kind of thing that shows up very nicely in the revolutions or the periodic domain that doesn't show up so well in the time domain. Now this is the constant speed example. What I'm going to do now is uh, leave this process behind. I'm going to open up another one I started earlier. When I drag glyph glyphs onto the screen, I can choose to save and reuse them like a template. This way then I can learn from what I've done previously and reuse it easily in the future. I'm going to take advantage of that right now so we don't spend all the time in our webinar today building up processes. I'm actually going to come over here and use this process that we call periodic in the revs domain. So this will take a minute to calculate. While that does, we can talk about this. What's happening here, as you can see from the time series input, it's the same type of channel data, cylinder pressure and crank speed. What's different this time is that crank speed is changing. So this gives us a challenge. We cannot put together a periodic, periodic window with a fixed delta T. If we did so, if we went off and said, look at the time series data with a 0 0.05 hertz, uh, excuse me, 0 0.05 second window, we'd end up with an even worse pile of smeared ugly data. So what we do instead then, the way we work around that is we use this thing called the position-based resampling glyph. This allows us to sample out of the time domain into the revolutions domain. This is what you see here. Okay, so this glyph, I've told it, that I want to resample the acceleration channel based on speed to get revolutions. That's what we see at the top here. I also want to resample the speed channel based on its own speed to get speed versus revolutions. Clearly, the math here may be new to you, but it's not terribly difficult to think about. The math inside this position-based resampling glyph says if we know the speed we're running at over time, speed and time together make revolutions. So let's resample as if we had taken data in the revolutions domain to begin with. And that's what we see right here. This data now shows cylinder pressure as a function of position or revolutions. So this, the x-axis here represents how many revolutions of the crankshaft we're seeing. In other words, the integral of speed over time. The reason why this is useful is that we know for a fact there ought to be some periodicity to this in the revolutions domain. Revolutions domain means mechanically watch the crank go round and round. I can use this to my advantage by setting up in periodic mode, let's look at a two revolution window, four stroke engine, two revolutions to complete the whole sequence. And now we can see a plot like we saw before where we have a nice continuous reproducible pressure in the cylinder as a function of rev. So this is essentially 0 to 2 revs or 0 to 360 times 2 or 720 degrees, two revolutions of the crankshaft. And also we can see that the, even though the speed varies, you can still see the same basic pattern. Crankshaft slows down, crankshaft speeds up. 
and there's some dynamics to get through, and then it repeats again and again and again and again. So again, looking in the angle domain or the revolutions domain can be very useful. This can be really interesting if you're trying to track down a noise in an engine, something that's going tick, tick, tick. You could find out not just how often does it happen, but where does it happen. When, when I say where, I mean where in the angle domain. If we had a, a mark of, of not just revolutions, but actual angle, what angle is the crankshaft relative to, say, top dead center, bottom dead center, we could find out that the tick, tick, tick noise actually occurs at a fixed angle, and therefore we may think it's the exhaust valve tapping on the piston, or maybe the intake valve tapping on the piston, or maybe the connecting rod big end bearing um, clunking against the, 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 connect, the uh, crankshaft when it goes through its uh, bottom dead center um, reverse of, of uh, velocity. So we can learn a lot. This is with variable speed data. So we have a very generic property or uh, process we put together now that can process constant speed or variable speed data and allow us to understand things in the revolution domain and also in the angle domain. The last thing we're going to look at today is, a, is another workspace here. Now this one is a little bit more durability related, not so much noise or performance. We looked before at vibration magnitudes versus frequency or cylinder pressure in a performance way. When does cylinder pressure change and how does that influence crank speed and, and so on. We're going to look at this in a more durability sense. And, 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 and the reason why is just assume that you're working with a, a, a gear set of some sort that carries torque. This could be a differential or an overdrive gear in a transmission or something like that. If we wanted to understand what was going on inside that gear set, what we'd want to do is record at least a couple of parameters versus time. Very basically, we want to make sure we cover at least torque and speed. And the reason why we care about that is that torque tells us how much stress can result. So if we think about ourselves as a gear tooth in a, in a gear set, the amount of stress or the amount of, say, stress that causes gear tooth bending or stress that causes wear or stress that causes some kind of a structural problem in this gear tooth is going to be proportional to torque. So there's some constant proportionality there. And I'm not too worried about that right now. Let's just think about measuring torque as a global input. So we can measure torque versus time, and that's what's seen in the red squiggly line up at the top. At the bottom is, is speed. At what rate is the gear shaft spinning? This is useful to us because if we know at what rate it's spinning, for how long, put those two together and use uh, some calculus, for example, and we can come up with not just a rate and a time, but the number of times something happened, number of revolutions. If you've been around durability of, of anything, we know that what's important to fatigue is how many cycles happened and how big were they. So how big are the fatigue cycles that the gear tooth feels? We'll learn about that from torque. The number of cycles that it sees, we'll learn about that from speed. This fundamentally differs, this rotational fatigue concept, fundamentally differs from other fatigue methods in the way that we're going to count cycles. We need to understand a cycle per revolution of the gear set, not per time or per change of magnitude. Even if we ran at constant torque, say this little time period right here, even though that's constant torque, every revolution at that torque level causes that gear tooth to see a reverse stress cycle a cyclic on-off of the stress because of the mesh-unmesh concept per revolution. So we can't just take the torque and cycle count it using, say, rainfall cycle counting. We have to be more aware of the concept of rotational fatigue and looking at a per-rev concept. So just to summarize all that, what we've just said is the key thing for a gear set in durability is counting cycles at torque and also speed as well. So some people call this cycles at torque and speed, or some people call this rotational cycle counting or rotational rain flow. The glyphs I've got on the screen are doing this for us. What we're after here is this. This chart shows me as the torque levels changed, as the speed levels change, how many revolutions of the part did we actually see? 
Of course, we can get to revolutions by integrating speed over time. RPM over time can give us revolutions. And then we just keep track of accumulated revolutions in little bins or, or bands of torque and speed. So really, this, this is really interesting information if you're into the gear set concept because we can look here and we can see that we have certain cycles that happen at relatively low torque but high speed. We have, fortunately, not too many cycles that happen at very high torque. That's a good thing because really fatigue damage or problems to our gear set is going to be governed by cycles of high torque. But anyway, this is essentially cycle counting in a rotational sense. How many cycles, at what torque, and what speed. Some people collapse this down into a 2D plot like this. This is now how many cycles as a function of torque, as opposed to torque and speed. I haven't put any fatigue damage calculation glyphs in this, but we could very easily take this two-dimensional histogram of number of revolutions versus torque and plug that into a calculation like this stress life glyph here that would allow us to do a, a stress life or a torque life fatigue calculation on the shaft or on the gear tooth or whatever this rotating component is to understand durability. Now, I'm not going to get into that calculation today just based on time, but it's easy to extend this calculation just by adding in a few more glyphs and making certain connections. So this is the way that we would do a fatigue calculation based on the rotational dynamics cycle counting concept that I've just introduced in the last few minutes here. The last thing I'll say about this example is up here I have a couple of tabular listings like this. This is the same data of torque and revs versus speed versus this one here is torque and revs. Uh, same data we saw, we saw plotted earlier. It just happens to be in a spreadsheet form here. If you wanted to have that data in a, an Excel spreadsheet to give to a supplier, for example, then I would just export this data to Excel. It come out as a CSV file, and that would be a useful thing. I've taken huge amounts of raw time series data in the time domain and converted it on, down to a nice, simple, compact torque rev speed histogram, or torque revs histogram, as I've shown in these two separate outputs. So those are three basic use cases that I wanted to cover today.